with you this morning. Go ahead and turn with me back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 as we continue just walking through the Word of God together. If you have been with us uh, in our study, then you'll remember as we came to chapter 7 that the Apostle Paul is dealing with specific questions that the church at Corinth has written to him, questions they had concerning marriage, uh, singleness, uh, divorce and remarriage. Uh, they were concerned about their social relationships. And, and the reality is when we come to our passage here, right in the middle of chapter 17, it seems like he departs from that, that particular emphasis. But the reality is he's simply reinforcing his argument from a different angle. So he's still dealing with the area of marriage and, and those relationships. We're going to talk about a lot of relationships this morning, a lot of our social, racial uh, distinctions that we have and that we make. But in reality, he's still, still dealing with the same argument here. And that was one of the problems that the church at Corinth had. Uh, they had a difficult time reconciling their... Um, their social relationships with their new relationship with Christ. What does this look like and how does it play out in my marriage, in my relationships, with my job, with, you know, with the different areas of my life? And so there was a lot of cultural pressure, pressure from outside the church. There were some very prevalent thoughts and ideas in Corinth in that day concerning, uh, concerning marriage. Remember, we talked about the, that ascetic lifestyle, a celibate lifestyle, and so there were those who were saying, you know, maybe to be more spiritual, I just need to simply get outside of this marriage, away from it, so I can be closer to the Lord. And then, you know, there was, there was the, you know, kind of the uh, hedonistic attitude within Corinth that said, you don't have to worry about rules or laws at all. You're free to do and live however you want. And even within the church, there was both legalistic and liberal thoughts and ideas that were being pressed upon those in the church. There were Jewish Christians who were saying marriage is the most important thing, and if you're not married, then you need to get married. And if you're not circumcised, you need to get circumcised. And there were those who were of the Gentile who were saying, you know, you, Paul said that circumcision doesn't mean anything. In fact, get rid of it altogether. <laughs> and so there was a whole lot of pressure and a lot of questions, and Paul's going to answer those questions for us in our passage this morning. And within those questions, I do believe there's much for us today. And so let's have a word of prayer and uh, we'll get into the word of God. Father, we are so thankful uh, for this time where we can gather uh, in your house, in your presence and worship you. As we lift our voices, Lord, we sing to you. As we pause now and we open up uh, your word, we are saying, Father, we want to hear from you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would just block out the thoughts and the cares and concerns of this world for a moment. And let our focus be on you alone and on what you have to say. Lord, I'll be the first to admit that what I say means nothing. Oh, but your word means everything to us. And so I pray that you would speak, speak in spite of me, speak through me in the power of your spirit, that you may be glorified that your word may be heard, and that it may have its way in us. Lord, you know each need. Lord, our heart's desire this morning as we come is that we would see souls saved. Lord, we know that no one's here by accident. We have been praying for those who would be in our midst who are yet without Christ, that they would see their need and trust in him. Lord, we're praying for those who are hurting and, and those who are in difficult circumstances. Lord, we pray that you would give them grace and that you would strengthen and encourage them and Lord, above all things, we pray that you would be glorified in us and that we might be more like you. And so I pray, Father, that you would bless our time this morning. You know my need. And Father, I pray that Jesus would be exalted above measure this morning. We ask it in his name and for your glory. And amen. I hid my water from myself. <laughs> now, Paul's primary, Paul's primary answer to their question about all these social distinctions is found in verse 17, but he reiterates and reemphasizes it three times. He says it in verse 17, he says it again in verse 20, and then again in verse 24. So notice with me, verse 17, he says, Only let each person lead the life 
that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. But look at verse 20. He says, again, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. And then verse 24, so brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. What's Paul saying? He's saying, be satisfied in your situation, in your circumstances. Right? You don't have to change your status to be a good Christian. <laughs> He's saying, you can be right where you're at, where I saved you, and serve my purpose. So if you're married... Stay married. If you're single, stay single. Now, again, this is a general rule. It's not a, it's not a hard and fast, and we'll see that. But by and large, God's, God's you know, purpose for you when he saved you was right where you're at. And so we don't have to be discontented. We don't have to be dissatisfied in our situation. We can say, Lord, I am exactly where you want me to be. And so where I am, use me. That's, that's what he's saying here. Live the life that God has called you to. Now, in this passage, there's a, there's a particular word you'll see over and over and over. In fact, it's, it's mentioned eight times in eight verses. Now, when you see a word that's mentioned that repetitively, then there's an emphasis that's trying to be made, yes? And so, what, what the Apostle Paul, that word is the word called, right? The word called, you see it repeatedly in verses 17 through 24. Now, that word, when we see the Apostle Paul use it, is almost always referring to God's divine call to salvation. So when he says, in which you were called, over and over, repeatedly, he's saying, when you were saved, when you were drawn to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. All right, Paul is going to, or um, Peter's going to mention this idea of calling here. Right? But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What's Peter saying? He's saying, God called you out of this and into this, out of darkness, into the light of Christ, right? Jesus is the light of the world. He chose you. He saved you. And we believe that call is an irresistible call. When God savingly calls one of his children, they respond by saying yes, right? That's, and so it's possible and this is, this is the, the beauty for me, because I can stand here this morning, and I can preach, and I have no power over your decisions. But we have a sovereign God. When he calls, right? It's possible you're here this morning, and you do not believe. That you do not believe in Jesus Christ, that you don't really want anything to do with this Christianity. And God will open your eyes and open your heart this morning for you to see the beauty of Jesus Christ, and for you to see your need of a Savior, and you respond. God is sovereign over salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. And so, I, I love that, because I can stand and preach every week, and it, you, the results are not on me. Right? If someone's going to get saved, it's because, the, it's because the Lord saves them. But brothers and sisters, what do you see here? He says, when you were called, where you were called, remain as you are. Right? That's, the, that, that's the, the teaching here. Right? He says, let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him. Right? The idea here is of, of, of a, dispro, a distribution or a dividing up. It's the same word that he uses of spiritual gifts later in, in chapter 12. In chapter 12, he talks about you know, giving to each one, each believer, a gift, distributing them. Right? That's what he's saying here. God has distributed, divided up his people into different areas of life. And that life, that area of life that you have been called to, live it. <laughs> live it for the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So that's the terminology that he's using. And, and that's the beauty of the church, right? Within this, even within this, the walls here this morning, right, we have Christians who are 
nurses and teachers and carpenters and secretaries and accountants and plant workers of various sorts. We have engineers and office managers and waitresses and plumbers and military personnel and bankers and police officers and housewives and pastors and the list goes on, right? I, I mean, I can't even begin to get to the end of all the different aspects and areas of, of service that we have within our congregation. And Paul's saying what? Your status, your circumstances is no surprise to God. He called you, he saved you, and he's given you a job. He's gifted you and assigned you in a very particular way, and that reflects very clearly the sovereignty of God. No matter what you have, what, what, no matter what you are, or what you've been called, God has you there. Now, now that's, that's important, right? It's important to keep in mind that you have a purpose bigger than you. When you go to work, when you go to school, when you wake up in the morning, where you're at, when you're at, God has a plan for you to use you. So, he says, this is my rule in all the churches. All right? So Paul's going to simply say, this is a very general guideline that I've given to, to all. This is not simply for the Corinthians. This is for everyone, which means it's for us. And when you come to know Christ as your Savior, as far as your circumstances are concerned, assume that you need to stay in that. Now, I'm not saying there's not times where you're going to change, right? Because it's going to happen, right? And the Lord's going to open those doors, and the Lord's going to lead in those areas. But assume, assume that God wants to use you where you're at. Don't be dissatisfied and discontented. And that can be hard, right? It's easy to have a mindset that if only things were different. If only, you know, if, if only I was married. If only I had a husband. If only, if only I could, if I could get a better job, right? If, if I could get a different job. If I didn't have to work these kind of hours. If, if, if only I wasn't in this circumstance. If only I wasn't in this situation. Then, then I could serve the Lord. Then I could, I could be involved in it. Then I could do these things. And so we can, we can begin to develop a dissatisfaction with where we're at in life. And we can say, you know, if things were different, then, then I could serve God the way I'm supposed to. Meaning that you can't where you're at. Brothers and sisters, God knows exactly where you're at. He knows your circumstance. He knows your situation. He's saying, not only be satisfied in that, but serve in that. You see the picture, right? Now, he's going to deal with some very particular scenarios in between that main general point, right? Verse 17, verse 20, verse 24, same emphasis. And in between, he's going to give some illustrations to help us. And so we're going to start in verses 18 to 19. He's going to deal with racial and religious status or standing. Verse 18, was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the mark of circumcision. Now, clearly here, when he talks about circumcision... He's talking to Jewish Christians, right? This would have been, this would have been their outward symbol of their, of their race, of their culture, of their religion, right? So we see that representation here. And he simply says this, let them not seek to remove the marks. So he says, if you're a Jewish Christian and you've been circumcised, you don't have to undo that to serve Christ. Now, I thought about that all week. I don't know how that works, right? I don't know how you undo that. And <laughs> apparently it's possible. Uh, there were actually surgical procedures that were done. I don't know how that works. But apparently you can do it. And they were doing it. Because Paul says don't undo it. Don't do that. Why? Because you can be a good Christian, a good follower of Christ, as a circumcised Jewish individual. Right? So he's saying where you were at, follow me. And then notice, was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. Here he's talking to the Gentile Christians. All of these making up the church at Corinth. They were both involved. <laughs> and he's saying this, if you're, if you're a Gentile Christian, 
you don't have to be circumcised to be a better Christian. And there were certainly those Jewish Christians within the church. We saw that when we went through the book of Galatians, those Judaizers who were saying, you need to follow the old law and you need to be circumcised if you're going to be a good, a good Christian, a good follower of Christ. If you want to be close to God as you can be. And, and Paul simply says, no, no. God knew your circumstance, your situation when you were called. And he's going to hammer home the point in verse 19. He says this, For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision. Now those are fighting words. That's, that's strong language, even offensive language that the Apostle Paul uses here. Paul was writing into a culture that was filled with ethnic racial, and religious pride. And he's saying, those things don't matter. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish. It doesn't matter if you're Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised. It doesn't matter if you're uncircumcised. We could, we could translate that, right, into our culture today. It has far-reaching implications, right? It doesn't matter if you're white. It doesn't matter if you're black. If you're, if you're white, don't try to become black. If you're black, don't try to become white. Right? I mean, it, we see this happening, yes? We see it happening in our culture today. You know, it doesn't matter about your, your, um, your national, your, 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 your ethnicity. You know, it doesn't matter if you're American or French or Russian or Chinese or German. or It just doesn't matter. Those distinctions are Nothing. Now, that's offensive, isn't it? We understand that. We are, we are a very, you know, we, we are a people with a strong national pride. And there's nothing wrong with that unless we distort it. And that's what was taking place here in the church. If, we, we, essentially, if, if you're not an American, then you can't be as good a Christian as what you need to be. So you're going to have to, you're going to have to convert. You're going to have to change, right? That's the, that's what we see here. And Paul's dealing with these issues. And he says, really, the only thing that matters at the end of verse 19 is what? But keeping the commandments of God. Your, your racial, your, your religious standing is insignificant. What matters is you keep the commandments of God. We see this even within denominational distinctions today. <clears throat> we see those who feel like, if I belong to this denomination or I go to this church, then I'm a better Christian than those people over there. <laughs> What's Paul saying? Those things aren't, they're, they're not important. What's important is what? That you keep the commandments of God. This is what matters. Now, that's a lining yourself up underneath the word of God but just think with me this morning, right? We'll just deal with the one, the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Right? If, we, if, we seek, if we seek to line ourselves up underneath that commandment, then we're going to find ourselves right smack in the heart of the will and plan of God. Love God with all that you are, with every, every part of your being. And love others the way God has loved you. <clears throat> the way you love yourself. Right? That's tough, right? So, for a moment, put aside your, your ethnic, your racial, your religious pride. And realize that what matters is following God and his word. Now, he doesn't stop there, right? Verse 20. Again, that reminder, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. That word remain actually has the idea of abide or stay at home in your racial, in your ethnic condition. Stay there where God has called you, as God has called you, because he's going to use you there. It's an actual command, a continual command. And then in verse 21, he shifts gears. Right? He moves away from the, the racial and the religious and the ethnic to social and economic status. All right? He says in verse 21, were you, a, 
bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Now that word bondservant actually means slave. So he's talking about slavery. Slavery was a huge deal within the Roman culture. There were more slaves than not. And so he says simply this, if you were a slave when called, when you were saved, don't worry about it. (laughs) Now, I don't want want you to think that Paul was pro-slavery. I don't think that Paul Paul endorsed or condoned the slavery system in his day any more than we endorse or condone the the slavery in the history of our country. But I do think this. Paul did not believe that that status had to change in order for them to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not have to be, you know, to become free in order to serve Jesus. Paul was saying you can serve right where you're at in the condition in which you were saved. His mission, right, Paul's mission was not to overturn the entire social status of the Roman Empire. His mission was what? To preach the gospel. <laughs> and so, if, if Paul would have made his issue slavery, he would have hindered his, purpor- his primary mission, which was the mission of the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul's saying, but, you know, a, a great example is that little letter of Philemon. Yeah? <laughs> Paul sends Onesimus, the slave, back to his master. Now, he could have said, you know, slavery... That's not, that's not for the people of God. But he didn't say that. Right? He said, Onesimus, you need to go back to Philemon. And I'm going to write a letter and tell him you know, how helpful and how beneficial you've been. You know, tradition tells us that Onesimus served faithfully alongside Philemon as brothers in Christ, but as a slave. And that was okay because God could use him right where he was at. And you know, this is pointing, right? This is pointing to social and economic status in that day. And Paul's theology is going to hit right at the very heart of the issue. Verse 22, he says, For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You hear, you hear the kind of funky balance there. If you were if you were enslaved when you were saved, you're free in the Lord. If you are free when you were saved, you're a slave of Christ. Right? This just <laughs> takes the the pride out of it altogether, right? If you are a, a wealthy free man, you're a slave. Right? If you're a slave Don't forget about your freedom in Christ. You've been set free. (laughs) And and so we have this balance here that that really helps to to weigh out their condition and their social status, their economic status. He says it's not significance in the scheme of things. Now this, I believe, is what... (laughs) This is where we really get caught up in our Western culture. Right. We, get, we, are, we are consumed with social status, economic standing, constantly looking for something better, something greater, something more. And so we find ourselves discontented, unsatisfied with what we have, where we're at in, in our current condition. And what's Paul saying here? It's not a big deal, right? It's not a big deal. We have that, the keeping up with the Joneses mindset in our Western culture. I've got, I've got to have more. I've got to have more. I've got to have more. If I don't have the right house and the right car and, and this and that, then what am I? And we tend to find our identity in stuff or in status, right? I've got to get the better job. I've got to get a higher rank. I've got to, you know, whatever it is within your standing And if I don't have that, then what am I? And Paul's saying, you're a Christian. You are free in Christ, free from these social standing and status. You don't need it to be a good Christian. 
Making more money is not going to make you a better Christian. <laughs> Having less money is not going to make you a worse Christian. Right? There's a reality here for us in our culture. Remain as you are. And if God opens the door for that to change, then Paul says what? He says, if you gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. <laughs> to the slaves, if you have a chance to be free, then be free. If you have a door that the Lord opens, then feel free to walk through that door. But make sure that it's not you who's pushing the door open. That's what he's saying. Be satisfied with your circumstances. We don't have to constantly, continually be seeking something better, something more, to be what God wants us to be. What matters is, in verse 23, you were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. You were bought with a price. What's he talking about here? Well, he's talking about their salvation, right? Their call. Their calling was made possible because Jesus Christ paid the penalty to set them free. Set them free from sin. Set them free from death. From the very penalty of sin. Because of our sin, we deserve punishment from a holy God. A price was paid to set us free. We sang about it this morning, right? There's power in the blood. The choir sang about the crimson crown. The death of of the Lord Jesus Christ, the precious blood of Christ that Peter wrote about was the cost of your freedom to be delivered from sin and delivered from death. You were bought with a price, right? We go back to chapter 6, verse 19. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. Glorify God in your circumstances, in your standing where you're at you're free you're free to serve the lord jesus christ who bought and paid for you yeah. a, a, a relationship with christ is compatible with any status with any standing you can be single and married or widowed and divorced you can be a slave or a free man you can be a jew or a gentile you can be a man or a woman you can you can live in any kind of society, democracy or total anarchy, right? You can be anywhere, any place in the world, and Christianity, Christ, is compatible with your status. Why? Because it's internal and not external. I think what Paul's saying this morning is simply this. If you're, if you're a husband, being a Christian should make you a better husband. If you're a wife, being a Christian should make you a better wife, right? Mom, dad should, should you know, in your job, in your situation, if you're, if you're a businessman, if you're a business owner, being a Christian should make you a better business owner. If you're an employee, being a Christian should make you a better employee, right? We don't have to seek to move or get out of these scenarios. If you're a single parent here this morning, you can still be a good Christian and a good parent in Christ. We don't have to, if you're, whatever situation you're in, God can use you. And that's, that's what Paul's painting over and over again. In, in verse 24, he reemphasizes it once again. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Now that's the key. Right? There's kind of a progression Right? In verse 17, live the life that God has called you to live. Right? God has called you right where you're at. Live that life. Verse 20, remain in it. In verse 24, remain in it with God. Right? With God, you can be what he's called you to be. Whatever that is. But only with him. When we seek when we seek to live life apart from him, we miss out on meaning and purpose. We miss out on what God has in store for us. Now, 
I think it needs to be said when, when you look at a passage like this that, you know, if you're, if you're here this morning and you're single, right, and, we, and we, have, we have some single, we have single parents here, we have single individuals, we have young people who are, who are one day, you know, I, I don't want you to think that Paul's saying that your singleness is the way you have to stay forever and ever and ever. All right? It's not what he's, it's not what he's saying. It's, it's not a hard and fast rule. In fact, you go back to, in the context, right, where we already looked at early in chapter 7, and he said what? If you cannot remain sexually pure, then get married, right? <laughs> so Paul's concerned with following, being obedient to the word of God. And so, yes, there's room for that status to change. If you're, if you're looking for a different job, looking for a better job, that's not necessarily wrong. Again, you ask yourself, what is my motivation? I mean, we look at the scripture and we saw, we see individuals who, you know, I mean, you look at the disciples. There was Matthew, who was a tax collector. <laughs> there was Peter, who was a fisherman. There, you know, and the reality is there's jobs that you can be involved in that when you're saved, you have to get out of because they're inconsistent with being a Christian. I mean, if you were a prostitute, you couldn't continue in that line of work and be a Christian, right? If you're a drug dealer, you can't continue in that line of work and be a Christian. And we kind of smirk at that, but drug dealers get saved and prostitutes get saved and people involved in all kinds of things get saved. Praise the Lord, right? We are called out of darkness into His marvelous light. It's the same thing you and I were called out of, out of sin. We had no hope apart from Christ. And God opened our eyes to see the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ and His salvation. And we answered that call. And in answering that call, I, I, I think we see this morning that God is more concerned, right? He's not, he's not as concerned about you getting something better or, or getting something more, but, but just serving Him right where you're at and whatever you're doing. So if you're a teacher, teach to the glory of God. And if you, if you work... And if you work in a blue-collar job, then work hard for the glory of God. If you sit behind a desk or in a cubicle, then work for the glory of God. If you're a student here this morning, then be a student for the glory of God. Whatever situation you find yourself in, remain there for the glory of God. If you're a... We saw last week, right? If you... If you're married and you're married to an unbeliever, you're unequally yoked, then be a Christian wife in that home. Be a Christian husband in that home for the glory of God. If you're single, be single for the glory of God. If you're married, be married for the glory of God. Whatever your stature, your status, whatever your situation, whatever your economic standing, do it all. For the glory of God. Because in the end, that's what matters, right? Obedience to the word of God. Living your life with God. Now, it's possible that there are some here this morning who are hearing that call. You know, pastor, I'm not really saved. I'm not a Christian. I don't follow Jesus Christ. And this morning, God is calling. He's opening your eyes to see your need of a Savior. Why not respond today? In this moment. I have no power over that. I can't make you do that. But there's a God who is moving. And if He's moving upon your heart, then respond in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, what do I do and how do I do? All you do is say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Save me. I believe in you. I believe in Jesus. I want to follow you with my life. You know, maybe you're here this morning and you are kind of in this boat where you've been just very discontent, unsatisfied with your situation. You're one of those who have been saying, you know, if only, if only this, if only that, then, then I could, then I could do this, then I could do that. it's not easy to stop and to say, Lord, here I am. You knew where I would be. 
use me right where I am. But maybe that's your need this morning, just to confess your discontentedness. When we are unsatisfied, we're unsatisfied with the God who made us. And that's sin. We have a, a beautiful collection of God's people from all walks of life. And God wants to use us, brothers and sisters. And so we gather here this morning to hear his word. And we're going to leave this place this week. And I want to I encourage you to be what God has called you to be. Where you're at. Be used for the glory of God in that place. Let's look to the Lord.